Hello, this is Bishop William Johnson from the Diocese of Des Moines. I want to offer a reflection for you, but before I do so, I'd kind of like to bring your attention to a special event that's happening nationally on Wednesday, October 7th, Feast of Our Lady of the Rosary. Archbishop Gomez of Los Angeles, who heads the United States Conference of Catholic Bishops, invites us as communities of faith throughout our country to join together in a moment of prayer in our nation, which we know is sometimes experiencing the tensions and those uh, stresses of vision and, and antagonism that can be intensified by our political season. And so our prayer for the unity of the country invoking Mary, Our Lady of the Rosary, we can unify in a moment. And for us in central Iowa, it would be at 2 p.m. on Wednesday on the USCCB live stream. We're going to also post it on our diocesan website. And so that can be a moment where we're actually present live time with one another. But it'll be available for you as well to access later on if you're scheduled does not permit you and so I encourage you to consider that opportunity. We're also going to be making available to our parishes and pastors a resource whereby we combine the great love that we have for our Eucharistic Lord, time spent in adoration, and also invoking Mary, Mary who's always close to Jesus, Mary the mother of the Eucharist who gave us the Word made flesh and so that'll be an opportunity that uh, you'll have the discretion in your communities throughout the month of October, the month of Mary, and also respect Life Month to pray that we might uh, promote a culture of life in the richest sense, especially from the unborn to those who are weak or vulnerable among us in any way, and that ultimately God, who has dominion all over all life, that we would honor and reverence Him with the fear of the Lord that is the Spirit's gift to us. I think about that way in which we pronounce the name of Jesus, Jesus who's always listening in spirit love to His own Father, fulfilling His mission with unswerving trust. We too have that opportunity to again turn our faces to Christ, to have him and not to uh, see our situation in a way that he holds us in contempt, but great affection for us, great patience and great mercy, that God wants to give us the space then to find our freedom and to come to believe with all our being. And so it's not something then that we want to be misunderstood or be indifferent in any way or ratify our own preferences, even as it comes to political matters as well, but that we can be called to be agents in our choices, in our political and other forms of participation, of truly building a kingdom, not of this earth, but that calls us beyond any kind of earthly affiliation to see ourselves primarily as Catholic Christians, disciples of Jesus and members of his body. And so Jesus asks us, you know, the times in which our no's become yeses, our yeses become no's, what is it that we, when we really follow the Father's will as we pray to do in the Our Father. So I think there's times where we might be discomforted a little bit within ourselves and that can be a grace that's given to us where we make a choice, we utter a word, make a decision that is rejecting something that somebody is asking of us. And so it's a kind of way in which those who know Greek call it metamalethes, a kind of aftercare where God is taking care of us but he's allowing us to experience that experience that discomfort as he dwells within us in that great intimacy that the Spirit affords. And so we have the opportunity to, to go back and perhaps make right what we did not choose initially to have our hearts then converted and conformed to him evermore. I know in my own life I felt myself stretched and things that I held with such great determination, things that when I was a young college student I thought, well of course we wouldn't allow felons to have voting rights. Why would we do that? They've made a mistake that should always kind of maybe mark their way and qualify their degree of participation in society. And I think I've come to say, what does their dignity, if they are truly restored and want to be rehabilitated and incorporated and back, shouldn't this be something that's afforded to them to exercise the full range of their civic freedoms? So that's one example for me, but I think each of us can be sifted in our own hearts because I believe God is calling us all to go deeper to that felt poverty of spirit that the saints embrace and discover new reservoirs of patience and peace that free us in our encounters with others, prompting us sometimes simply to be silent and at other times with great confidence and courage to speak as the Spirit wills. We Christians don't want to become simply one more faction in our society trying to shout down others or to perpetuate that lie that it doesn't really matter what one believes as long as one is a good person. 
It's not foreign to us to detect in our young people a wanting to keep their options open, to be tolerant of others and their choices no matter of what they say and do. But that can keep us from calling each other out and really being challenged and that we can just simply retreat to those people who are like-minded with us. And I don't think that's how God is calling us along this pilgrim way. We even recognize the temptation in those who call themselves pro-choice to ratify those painful decisions that ultimately hurt rather than help, that do not promote life but ultimately wound and, and, and terminate it. We recognize that we can become hardened and resistant in our ways of acting and choosing to assert a right not to listen to that gentle spirit voice of aftercare within us that would unite us within ourselves and lead us back to communion, not only in our society, but the communion that matters most with Christ and his church. And so we appreciate that Jesus wants us to, to feel ourselves maybe at times to be in a minority in a world that's lost its bearing as we strive to do God's will. But we don't take consolation and heaven forbid that we should delight in thinking ourselves somehow better than the majority. And so we pray, grace us, O God, to be ever more constant, more unwavering in our yes to you. Free us to engage our communities, our diocese, our country, not with shrill voices fueled by fear or dissatisfaction, let alone the ambition for power, and hopefully not a sense of apathy, like whatever. We want to be full participants in our presence with others, affording them the space where we will listen to them, that we can rediscover then together how you are always patiently turned on us. Jesus is eternal obedience, who doesn't cling to his own rights, but in his right to lay his life down, freed by the Spirit, calls us to do no less, to say yes to Christ who is our life, to the Jesus whose name is above all names. Thank you for listening. Let's continue to pray for each other.